Hey everybody, happy Friday morning. I almost said Friday afternoon for the emerging leaders later today, but I didn't. Caught myself. Happy Friday morning. Hope everybody's doing well all across North America. APWA, frontline leaders. Frontline. You say, well, I don't have a title of a leader. Hey, we're all leaders, right? Leadership at all levels. Leadership in changing times. All right, guess what? Last teaching session. That's right. Last teaching session and then three weeks of reinforcement and we're done. It's over. So did you pick out one thing? That's a crazy thing, right? We got three weeks to go. Did you pick out one thing? Did you think about picking out one thing but didn't pick out one thing? Did you pick out one thing? So, you know, 13 weeks or 12 weeks later, did you pick out one thing? I hope that you did. All right, what are we doing today? We're talking about continuous improvement. Now, we're going to do some psychology today. We're going to do some psychology today. We're going to talk about a concept that maybe you've heard or maybe even your organization has discussed. But we're going to drill into it. And then we're going to lay it out over the next three weeks. Because I think it's critical in these changing times. And it'll be how we wrap up our 15 weeks together. Continuous improvement. But before we can talk about continuous improvement, which is, which is so discussed, it's almost trite. We got to talk about a lie. A lie? Yeah, a lie. There's a lie. In North America, you and I have bought into a lie. Even you guys in Australia bought into a lie. Western culture has bought into a lie. Here's the lie. Bust your butt for 20 plus years, 25 years, whatever it is, and then get yourself to a place where everything stays the same. Yeah, kill yourself, figuratively speaking. Work as hard as you possibly can so that you get to a place in life where things stay the same. And that, that's a lie. That's the lie. You say, what do you mean that's a lie? Well, you know, you've heard it. You've heard that lie. Well, why is it a lie? Why is this concept of working as hard as I possibly can to get to a place where things stay the same? Why is that a lie, Ian? Well, first of all, there's nowhere in the universe and there's no place on God's green earth that nature would support that. There, there's nothing. Things are either growing or they're retracting. There's either expansion or atrophy. And I mixed two metaphors there. <laughs> I mixed two metaphors there. <laughs> Anyways, I should have said expanding and retracting and then growing or atrophy, but I didn't. I messed them up. Anyways. So stop and think about that. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in nature that stays the same. Nothing. So why do you think in life things would stay the same? Well, once we get through this rough patch, things will smooth out and stabilize. And we'll get into just like a normal routine. Well, what? There's no place in the universe that would, that would support that. So what's your point? Well, I've made the point now for 12 weeks that progress and change are indelibly intertwined. There can be no progress without change. I made the case that we're in e extreme changing times that you could call a time of transformation, just like Drucker called it a time of transformation. So I think it's in your best interest and my best interest to know how to change. I think it's in your best interest and my best interest to understand a concept that gets ahead of change, that's proactive. That's the whole point of that system's thinking that's catalytic in nature. That's a whole thing of being a catalyst for responsibility. And I call it continuous improvement. And so did a guy named Deming. Listen to this quote. The lie is that things stay the same. That things staying the same, I'm sorry, is the ideal. I would suggest to you there's no safety or insecurity in things staying the same. There is only safety and security in learning how to adapt, overcome, and continuously improve. 
If one can establish continuously improving as a part of their being, they dramatically increase their chances of personal security. So here's the lie. I'm going to get myself in a secure place by creating an environment where things stay the same. There is no support for that. So all you guys and gals that are fighting the changes, you're fighting a losing battle. There's only safety and security in, a, in creating a being, creating myself to be able to adapt and overcome, to be able to adjust. Look at, look at San Francisco at the turn of the century, at the turn of the, uh, of the last century. They had a massive earthquake, massive earthquake. We talk about the tragedies of Katrina and, and the tsunami and things of that nature. That, that natural disaster that occurred in San Francisco, they just stopped looking for the bodies. They, 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 they just devastated. The earthquake devastated the community. Some really smart people started looking around and say, well, wh what was one of the reasons for that? Well, one of the reasons was that the buildings weren't built to withstand the shaking of the ground. They were rigid. And that rigidity, when things started to shift, that rigidity destroyed them and was catastrophic. The rigidity was catastrophic. Today, if you go to San Francisco, like many major cities that are in earthquake-plagued areas, you'll notice that there's literally huge shock absorber-like devices at the bottom of buildings. Buildings have been designed to sway and move as the ground shakes. Buildings can, can move with the ground movement. Now, does it mitigate all risk? Does it eliminate, I'm sorry, all risk? No, but it mitigates it significantly. So they move from rigidity to flexibility. So what does that mean for you? Well, I've gotten to know many of you over the last 12 weeks. We've interacted. You've sent me emails. I've sent you emails. Others of you I, I haven't gotten to know. But I know you as a friend of the profession, as an advocate for what you do every day, heed my advice. Rigidity will destroy you. Safety and security does not fight, does not come from fighting for everything to stay the same. Safety and security comes when I can overcome and adapt, when I'm an adaptable person. Well, I'm not changing my values and principles. I agree. Don't change your values and principles. We're talking about style and approach. See, there are some things in life that are unchanging. I believe that. There are truisms. I believe that. You can argue with me. You can fight with me. Whatever. I don't care. But the, but the fact of the matter is I believe that there are some things that are unchanging. And there is support in nature to that too. Gravity. <laughs> there is no relative truism to gravity unless I leave the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> so I think there are some things, some values, some principles, some truisms. But our styles can change to what the times require. So don't buy the lie that says, let me fight to keep things the same. Why? Why not create systems and processes so that we have some semblance of normalcy, but then constantly be looking at those systems and processes in our own personal life, in the life of our organization, and, and see if they're the ones the times require. And then if they're not the, times, the ones the times require, change them. But what we stand for, our principles and values don't have to change and act as a guiding light of what the how of those principles and values should be. So don't get the two mixed up. Don't get the how mixed up with the why. The why doesn't change, but the how may. The how may change. I mean, principally speaking, principles now. So 
So this idea of continuous improvement is about getting ahead of that changing time so that we're learning to constantly be improving ourselves. Now, if you do an exploration of history, you find something quite unique, actually quite outstanding to me, that in Western society, we're working as hard as we possibly can to get things to stay the same in our personal life. But in many, many other cultures, especially ancient cultures, that was not the case. If you look at the ancient Greeks, you know what? The people of Athens, the people of Athens would have told you that all the way till the time they die, they're trying to improve their mind, body, and spirit. That there was great honor in continuing to learn. There was great honor in, continu in continuing to grow. There was great honor in, in gaining perfection as you grew as a person. Or you could look at the ancient Chinese. The, the drive or move towards enlightenment, that, that you were constantly trying to grow and become more and more enlightened. Or how about the Hebrew culture? Sojourning through life, sojourning, growing through life. But here in today's society, all of a sudden we, do, we think we're going to do this. All of a sudden one day, boop, I made it. I made it. Now I don't have to do anything. You know, we read about Zuckerberg or whatever his name is, or we read about somebody hits the lottery, or we re I made it. I hit the jackpot. Hit the jackpot. That's crap. That's a lie. Because even if you got all the money in the world, you're not to the place of, you know, your own, own personal growth. That's ongoing. The same is true within an organization. Say, Ian, man, you're really beating this horse. I am beating it because it's so ingrained in us. It's so ingrained in us. And so we get rigid. We get rigid and we fight for our biases and we fight for things that, that just don't matter. And we lose the big picture in the whole scope. So continuous improvement, this idea of continuous improvement is about getting ahead of that thing called transformation and making just improving ourselves a part of what our normal routine is so that when the world around us shifts, it's no big surprise to us because we're constantly looking at how we're doing things and we're constantly refining and improving it. So it's not some big, you know, wake-up call for us. Okay, I have beaten that horse. So don't buy into the lie. There's nowhere in nature that supports it. And all great cultures of history realize you've got to continuously improve as individuals. Because if you don't, you become stagnant. And what does stagnant water smell like? It stinks. There's got to be continual growth. And I'm talking about mentally, and I'm talking about your physicality, and I'm talking about your relationships. I'm talking about all aspects of your life. There's got to be that continually moving yourself forward, in my opinion. So why don't we? Why don't we continuously improve? Well, one reason is for the, 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 the example I just gave. Because we're driving to, we get to a place where we've made it. Secondly, it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. It's work to continuously improve. It's work to go to the gym. It's work to read the book. It's work to do those things. It's work to, to foster a deeper relationship with somebody. It's work. It takes work, and we're tired. And there's all kinds of external pressures around us that make us tired. And it's stuff we do to ourselves, polluting ourselves with stuff that's no good for us, both mentally and literally with the stuff we put in our body, to just all the things that are going on in society and the stressors, and we're tired. And then the thought of reading that book or the thought of, of going to the gym or the thought of going for that walk, all of it's like, ah, let me just lay down until that thought goes away. It's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Continuous improvement takes work. So we bought into the lie. It takes work. And then finally, oftentimes we don't see the immediate results. There's no immediate result in it. Wisdom is about preparing for days we hope will never come. 
Wisdom is about preparing for days we hope will never come. So because we don't see the immediate result, we don't see the, the, the necessity. Things are pretty good right now. What do I, what do I, things are going along pretty good. And then the worship, then the earth shakes. Right? Then the earth shakes. So that's the reality. The earth is going to shake. So will you get yourself in a place where you can overcome and adapt, preparing yourself for when the earth shakes? Because sometime in your life, the earth is going to shake. Well, I still don't understand what the, nothing you said had to do with work. Everything I've said had to do with work because it has to do with life. So when, when the budget gets reduced and all of a sudden I've got to go move to another department or another uh, a job classification because we've rearranged everybody to avoid a layoff, how am I going to overcome that? Am I going to adapt and overcome? Or is my life and everyone's life around me going to be a living hell? Because I'm so upset and I'm so rigid, I can't change. So it is practical. It is real. Because these are things that people are going through every day. Because Drucker was right. We're, right. we're in one of those times of transformation. So where did the, the phrase, this, this idea, continuous improvement, come from? Well, they say the father of it was a guy named Deming. Deming. Edwards Deming, W.E. Deming. He was an, an innovator. He was a writer. He was a lecturer. He was an academic. He was a statistician. He was a business guru. He was a lot of things. And just after World War II, the United States government gives Deming a call. Hey, Deming, do us a favor. We want you to go over to Japan. Go over to Japan. Yeah, now that the war is over, we got to help rebuild Japan we got to help rebuild them so that they can be a viable player in the global market. So Deming goes over, and he's, got a, his, he's challenged with helping rebuild their manufacturing sector. So when he gets there, and he starts to research the culture, and he starts to understand it all, he comes across this thing. And forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. My, my wife speaks Japanese. She's not Japanese, but she speaks Japanese because she did business over there for a while. Lived there. And the, the word is kaizen. It means to, to continuously be getting better. That mind, body, and spirit, I'm getting better. I'm improving. Now, I'm, I'm simplifying the concept, but, but I'm improving. I'm not waiting for external pressures to force me to improve. I'm not waiting for a crisis to improve. I'm not waiting for tragedy. I'm not waiting for my wife to bark at me to improve. I'm improving continuously in my mind, in my body, in my spirit. And Deming was like, dang, that's good. What if we could take that and bring that into the manufacturing concept? What if we didn't wait for our customers to complain to improve our product? What if, we didn't, um, what if, we, if we didn't wait for a failure on the assembly line to be looking for ways to improve the assembly line? What if we were looking for ways to improve internally without external pressures or without anything being wrong? What if we were just improving on our own? And everybody went, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> and Deming said, well, maybe it is, but guess what? We would always be ahead of the change curve. Or at least we would mitigate the risk of being behind it. And we could build a global leader in manufacturing. So Deming then took those concepts and he brought them back to the car industry in Detroit a long time ago and helped build those big three, those concepts helped build those big three and others. And now continuous improvement is in the workplace a, a household word or phrase, I mean. But do we really understand what it's about? 
And do we really understand why it's important to us as individuals and how it could serve us well in a time of transformation? And then any time so that we can become individuals that adapt, overcome. And you could drop us into it just about any place and we could make it. See, that's what I'm talking about. When I look at you and your profession, that's what I'm talking about. That you're equipped to drop into just about any situation and make it. See, continuous improvement as a part of who you are will allow you to be able to have a fighting chance in just about any situation, in the workplace, in the job market, whatever. Look at this. It's not necessary to change. Survival's not mandatory. <laughs> Look at what Deming said there. It's not necessary to change. It's fine if you don't want to change, but survival, because survival's not mandatory. And I don't think he meant literal survival in a civilized society. I don't think he meant that. I think he meant our organizations. I think he meant our, us figuratively. Stress and pain and heartache. Look at the one at the top. Once you think you've arrived, you've already started your descent. That goes back to the, the support, the first thing I, I led with, which was, are you buying into a lie that says you've made it? The moment you think you've made it, you've already started downhill. All right, turn the page. So, self-survey. So here's what we're going to do. For the next three weeks, we're going to unpack three concepts. Starting today, we're going to unpack three concepts over the next three weeks that I think will help you build in you, in your toolkit, this idea of continuously improving. But before we do that, let's look at the self-survey. So the competency. Today's leader practices ongoing personal and professional growth and development. Continuous improvement. Today's leader has a, has a part of them, the guy or gal who's going to make it, has as a part of them that they're continually looking to improve themselves. They're not walking with the mindset that life is some destination that I get to. Bop! I made it! I don't have to do anything anymore. That, that today's leader gets that that is off the table completely. That that just won't work today. I had an old guy tell me one time, he said, you never get to retire from being a citizen. That's what it takes to build a free society that you have everybody pitching in. All right. I have in practice an ethical code of conduct. Now, we talked about code of conduct already. We talked about a code of conduct. We talked about the three questions. I'm able to articulate my personal values. What do you stand for? What are you about? You know, the old figurative, uh, the old uh, uh, visual planting your flag in the sand. What are you about? I have life and career goals and a plan for attaining them. That's that life five most urgent questions. Do you have some goals for your life? Do you, are you headed in some kind of direction? Any direction. How many of you know people that have no direction whatsoever? Life is just a series of Wednesdays. Oh, Wednesday, two more days to go. Oh, Wednesday, two more days to go. They have no purpose, no meaning, and they're just meandering through life. And they wonder why they're depressed, and they wonder why they're down. Figuratively speaking, they're just walking dead. They got nothing. I adhere to organizational core values and professional code of ethics. There's something about having organizational values and principles and some ethics that, we, that we gives us a, a, it lifts us, it lifts our spirit, it lifts who we are, especially then when we walk those out. And there's alignment between what we say we are and what we do. There's something positive about that. My little girl, Nadia, she's in karate. And, and, and the, the instructor had asked her to do her a, a certain thing 30 times a day. And I asked her yesterday, I said, have you done that? And she said, well, not today. And I said, okay, you got a choice. You can either do it or tomorrow morning it'll be a burden of an uncompleted task. Which, you, which one you want to be? You can either go do the 30 as much as you don't want to do it, or tomorrow morning, just know this, mark my words, little Nadia, tomorrow morning, you're going to feel guilty, and you're going to feel burdened, and it's going to be a, a, a feeling inside of you of something you didn't do. So which one you want it to be? And she's like, well, really, I'd just like to watch Good Luck Charlie. <laughs> ah! How'd, 
you like to be in my house every day? How bad would that suck? Anyway, she's like, well, Dad, actually, I'd just like to watch Good Luck Charlie. I'm not trying to change the world today, Dad. I'm eight. <laughs> I have a professional development plan. You got a plan? Ian, I'm just trying to make it through life, man. I'm just, I'm just paying my bills every day. I'm just, hey, come on, man. It's not earth shattering, dude. Okay. Okay, so let, let's have everybody in the country take that stance. Who's going to do anything? Is it somebody else's job to build you a country? Somebody else's job to build you a province or a state? Somebody else's job to build you a town, a neighborhood? And I don't mean figure, I don't mean literally build it for you, because some of you are in the business of building it. I mean, figuratively speaking, whose job is it? to coach a little league team? Whose job is it to volunteer at the church? Whose job, or the mosque, or the synagogue? Whose job is it to, to go and work with the battered women? Whose job is it to, to make sure the dogs at the pound get a walk? Whose job is all of that? What's all of our jobs? I promote the value of learning for myself and others. When's the last time you learned something? I don't need to learn anything. I know some of you, a couple of you had sent me an email saying that when we started all this, I don't need to learn anything. You're dumb as a rock, dude. You bought into that lie that things can stay the same. You don't understand the concept of arte or Kaizen or sojourning, of growing and moving towards enlightenment. Right? That's why you're a fool. And I don't mean that to be mean. It just means you're short-sighted. Because when the, when the ground shakes, you're not going to be prepared because you haven't continuously improved yourself. I seek to per and participate in opportunities for mentoring. I participate in new opportunities and ways to improve and grow. I actively participate in professional associations, professional certifications. There used to be a day, this idea of craftsmanship, this idea of being part of a guild where I perfected my craft. And there was honor in perfecting my craft and getting better at my craft and getting better at my craft. And we honored people who were great at their craft. And even the ones that were great at their craft wanted to get better at it every day. And that it didn't matter what your chosen profession was, you were honored for getting better at your craft. Craftsmanship. There was honor in that. Not as much anymore. Okay, so over the next few weeks, we've got three keys to continuous improvement. Three keys to continuous improvement. First, our pattern of thinking. I would suggest to you that, uh, that, that continuous improvement begins with my pattern of thinking. How do I approach? Remember when we talked about systems thinking, we talked about grooves in our brain? Grooves in our brain, that there was patterns of thinking, grooves in our brain? that we think in the same sequence over and over and over again. That when we saw a problem, we probably approached it basically the same way. When someone made us angry, we approached it in the same way. And that was, that was through our life experiences and the way that, that we were taught and the influences upon us got us to where we had this pattern of thinking, of sequence and sequence and sequence and sequence. Well, it's safe to say that by the time you get to be the age we all are, that some of those patterns are ingrained. And so we're going to talk about those. If you want to establish continuous improvement, you got to have a plan. You got to plan that work, and then you got to work that plan. And we'll talk about that. And then you've got to have strategies for overcoming burnout and sustaining the momentum. So those are the things that we'll talk about over the next three weeks. For the balance of our time together, we're going to talk about these, these patterns of thinking. Okay, so what a pattern of thinking, that sequence of thinking, how do I approach something? How do I think something through? Well, we know that all actions come from thoughts, right? Words come from thoughts. The way I do things come from thoughts. So if you're going to really establish continuous improvement, you got to start with your thoughts. So a pattern of thinking, simply put, is the sequence of thoughts that I use to come to a conclusion, come to a decision, come to an action. Why does it matter? Because of what I just said. 
everything that I do, everything that I say comes from the way I think, right? The way I think. So what's your pattern of thinking? Remember I told you we we're going to do some psychology today. What's your pattern of thinking? I want to go through this little self-survey. I know we already did one, but here's a, a cute little funny one. Do I take credit for positive events or do I chalk them up to chance? One end of the spectrum, one, I'm not like that at all. Other end of the spectrum, 10, I'm 100% like that. So wh where do you fall? When something good happens, do I expect more good things to follow or do I view positive happenings as a fluke? Well, you're talking about attitude. No, I'm talking about the way you think. What about negative events? Do you blame yourself or look at extenuating circumstances? Do you look at one negative event as evidence of more negative events to come? Like an, like an omen? Like things happen in three? Like my wife? So if something goes wrong and then something else goes wrong, she's like, oh, don't leave the house. Something will go wrong. Do I tend to encourage myself mentally or do I berate myself? in my head. Think about that one. Listen to this one. Would I talk to a friend or a precious child the way I talk to myself? Do I talk to a friend or would I talk to a friend or a precious child in the same way I address myself? Well, there's a lot of psychological mumbo jumbo. Just follow me because there's a lot of validity to this. When we talk about being our best, when we're talking about adapting and overcoming, when we're talking about having a solid team within a workplace, when we're talking about problem solving and we're talking about how to build a stress-free environment, it all starts with our patterns of thinking. Macro change happens on a micro level. Well, my boss needs to hear this. Hey, look, you can't control your boss. The only thing you're going to be able to control is yourself. So if we want to be able to adapt and overcome, it's about how we do us. About how we lead us, selves, ourselves. Here's some common patterns of thinking. I just want you to listen to them and see if, if, if any of them strike a chord with you. Magnification, minimization. Similar to mental filtering, disqualifying the positive. This thinking pattern involves placing a stronger emphasis on negative events and downplaying the positive ones. The customer service representative who only notices the complaints of customers and fails to notice the positive interaction is a victim of magnification and minimization. Another form of this pattern is knowing, known as catastrophizing, where one imagines and then expects the worst possible scenario. It can lead to a lot of stress. So let, let's talk real now. Maybe not in your department, but in a, a department down the road in another municipality or agency. You hear about wage freezes. And so then you start to magnify that. Magnify it, magnify it, and play out a whole scenario. Or maybe you're one of those kind of people that has an argument with yourself. You hear a supervisor who has an interaction with someone else, and then you start saying to yourself, well, if that supervisor ever talks to me, then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to, and the next thing you know, you literally have had a 20-minute argument with a supervisor who's never going to talk to you about that thing. I'm sure we all do that at our houses with an in-law. Well, if my mother-in-law brings that up, I did that once. Well, I'll tell you right now, if Kathy brings that up, I'm going to la 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 An hour, an hour. And my wife looked at me and she said, you know that that conversation is never going to happen. Well, it might. So you're going to go through all this stress for a conversation that might happen? Magnification, minimization. Does this thinking pattern strike a chord with you? Emotional reasoning. This is a big one. This one is close to relative, close relative to jumping to conclusions, as it involves ignoring certain facts, then drawing conclusions. Emotional reasoners will consider their emotions about a situation as evidence rather than objectively looking at the facts. I feel completely overwhelmed. 
Therefore, my problems are impossible. Listen to that. I feel completely overwhelmed. Therefore, my problems must be completely beyond my ability to solve them. How many people do you know like that? Yeah, they just quit. Or, I'm angry with you, so you must be wrong. I'm guilty of that sometimes. I am angry at you, so clearly you are in the wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. Both are examples of faulty emotional reasoning. Acting on beliefs as facts can, understand, understandably, contribute to even more problems to solve. Now, think about that in the work context. Are you utilizing emotional reasoning when dealing with management, leadership, supervisors? Are you using emotional reasoning when dealing with your coworkers? Are you looking at the facts? Or are you letting your emotions jump to certain conclusions where you add up 2 plus 2 and you get 68? And now you're angry. And because you're angry, they must be wrong. Think about that spiral. Should statements. Those, rely on, those who rely on should statements tend to have rigid rules set by themselves or others that have always need to be followed, or at least in their minds. They don't see the flexibility in different circumstances. They put themselves under considerable stress, trying to live up to these self-imposed expectations. If your internal, internal dialogue involves a certain number of shoulds, you may be under the influence of this pattern. So, well, I should do this and should do that and should do this and should do that and they should do this and they should do that. I deserve this and they deserve that. Now, there are certainly some things you should do. There's no doubt about it. But when it becomes to the point of rigidity, when you start looking at your fellow teammates and start judging them based on what they should do, that becomes a challenge especially when it then flows into emotional reasoning. Labeling and mislabeling. He's a whiner. She's a baby. I'm a loser. Really? Really? That's high school. That's, that's middle school. But you and I both know we do it every day. Yeah, but they really are a whiner, Ian. <laughs> they really are a complainer. Those who label or mislabel will habitually place labels that are often inaccurate or negative on themselves and others. I'm just useless. I'm just a useless worrier. I'm a whiner. She's a phony. These labels tend to define people and contribute to a one-dimensional view of them, paving the way for overgeneralizations to move in. Labeling cages people into roles they don't always apply, prevent us from seeing people and ourselves as they really are. It's certainly a big no-no when it comes to inner work, uh, inter teammate or personal relationships, working together in a team setting. So, do you label people? And then have you put them in that pigeonhole? And even no matter how hard they try to get better, any time that they do something that would reinforce that original label, do you say, see, they've never changed? Really? Finally, personalization. Those who personalize their stressors tend to blame themselves or others for things which they have no control over, creating stress where it need not be. Those prone to personalization tend to blame themselves for the actions of others or blame others for their own feelings. Now, why is any of this important? Well, because we said one of the things that stops continuous improvement, one of the things that just cuts it off at the knees is our attitudes, is the environment in which we're a part. So why create any more stress than I need to? The world's stressful enough as it is. There's a basketball player. Some of you may have heard of him. He happens to be from Canada, but he plays in the NBA, and he's been an all-star and an MVP a number of times. His name is Steve Nash. He's 37, 38 years old and still playing at a high, high level, a world-class level. I, heard, I was listening to an interview from Nash the other day, and it, and it was very interesting what he said. Because they asked him, they said, you know, you're old in terms of the NBA, and you're still having a, you know, a great, great season for the position that you play. 
What's your secret? You know what he said? He said, I can't afford at this age to be able to put any self-induced stressors on. From the food that I eat, to the thoughts that I think, to the relationships that I have, I, I just don't have the option of having a bunch of stressors that I can control. And why would I do that, he said. That would be foolish. It's bad enough as it is that I'm an old, old man in a young man's game. I don't need to add to my challenges. Now stop and think about that, Jeff. I don't need to add to my challenges. I don't need to make it worse for me. And he's talking all the way down to what he puts in his body, what he eats. Now you can make the argument that he makes millions of dollars and his body is the key to that. Sure. But for all of us, why would we want to do anything more to stress ourselves out? So these patterns of thinking, these patterns of thinking are key. What's the old phrase? As a man thinks, so he is. As a man thinks, so he is. So if you have some faulty patterns of thinking, you can almost assume, logically assume, that you're increasing your stressors. And in a time of transformation in the world, do we need to really increase our own stressors? Do we really need to turn our controllables against us? Come on now. That makes no sense. If, you've, if any of these feel a little too familiar, that's a good thing. Recognizing a pattern of thinking that isn't serving you well is the first step to moving past it. So, some of these things strike a chord. Good. Because now you've identified it and you can move forward. All right, turn the page. So now, those are some negative patterns of thinking that may not serve you well. Let's talk about some positive patterns of thinking. Or, or I don't want to use the word positive and negative because then it gets into mental attitude and I don't want to have an argument with anybody. So, I think you would all agree with me that those patterns of thinking probably wouldn't serve somebody well. So, let's talk about some patterns of thinking that would serve somebody well, that we probably could agree. Three of them that I'd like to use as examples. A basic pattern of, oh, and one we've already talked about. A basic pattern of thinking, a decision-making pattern of thinking. How do you make decisions? And then the outside-the-box innovation pattern of thinking, which we talked about previously. But look at the basic pattern of thinking. A basic pattern of thinking to approach, approach what's going on around you. One, thought one, all things are possible. All things are possible. That's not true. Really? You know, if I do an exploration of history, things that were seemingly impossible one minute, within 20 years were possible. Do an exploration of history. Things that were completely impossible today are possible just a hundred years ago there were things that were outside of the realm of reasonableness that are now possible they locked Marconi up the guy who invented the the radio or the basic fundamentals that became the radio they locked him up because he said he was cra they said he was crazy. He was out of his mind that words and sound could travel. Words could travel through the air long, long distances without wires. Hello, Bluetooth. Hello. Thank you, Marconi. What's your point, Ian? My point was they locked him up in an insane asylum. So history tells me that all things are possible. I know that both the improbable and the implausible happen all the time. The San Antonio Spurs were down by 24 points to the Los Angeles Clippers and won by like 20. What in the heck? Sounds like you had a bet on that game, Ian. Listen, I, we're not talking about that right now. <laughs> so the implausible and probable happens all the time. So you can't walk into a situation and say, that's impossible. In my opinion, I think you've got to walk into the situation looking for the possibilities. Secondly, choice. I have a choice of what I think, what I say, what I do, which means I always have options and I always have power. So for me, I'm going to walk into any situation and say, well, all things are possible, first of all. And then the second thing I'm going to say is, I got a choice. I got a choice in my thoughts. I got a choice in my words. I got a choice in my actions. I always have a choice. 
which means that, and this is critical, I have options and I have power. See, the funny thing is, as soon as I say it's not possible and I have no options, I'm completely powerless. And who in the world wants to be in a place where they're powerless? You can't do anything from that position. There is no, that's not a position of strength. And that's a pattern of thinking. I just, I just showed you those patterns of thinking. That emotional reasoning that says it, it's too much. It's, it's overwhelming. Nothing can be done. Powerless. Victim. Now, that could be in an extreme or that could be in the minor. Then responsibility. I have a responsibility and my world is a direct reflection of me. So one, it's possible. And history proves to me that things that seemingly are impossible are possible. I got some choices, which means I got some power and some options. And frankly, I probably have a responsibility. Remember we talked about 10-foot rule? 10-foot rule. If it's within 10 feet of me, it's my responsibility. If it's within 10 feet of me, it's my responsibility. That's a worldview. That number three is a worldview, that the world's a direct reflection of me, so what am I going to do with it? That's a leader's talk. That's leader's walk. And you don't need a title to say that the world's a direct reflection of me and then go do something to make it a little bit better. And no, you can't change the whole big bad world, but you've heard me say it 10 times if you've heard me say it 1,000. You can handle your little corner of the world. And then the final thought in that pattern of thinking, commitment. Whatever I choose, I'll give it all I have. So once I make that choice to be involved in that thing, I'm giving it my best. And that goes back to pride, and that goes back to self-reliance and self-determination, and that goes back to being a leader. That's just the way it is. If I'm going to do something, we're going to do it all the way, or we're not going to do it. Now stop and think about that simple pattern of thinking. Now I'm not telling you to adopt this pattern of thinking, let's be clear. I'm just sharing it with you to say, what if you put that in your sequence of thinking? If you started walking into situations and saying, oh, you know, all things are possible. Let's look for the possibilities. And then you said, well, you know, I always have choices. I, got, I can choose what I say. I can choose what I think. I can choose what I do, which means I'm never optionless or powerless. And you know what? The world is a direct reflection of me, and I have a responsibility to at least handle my 10 feet. And then finally, you know, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it all the way. Now, do you think that pattern would serve you better than some of those other patterns that we talked about, especially in changing times? Now, look, I know this is fairly deep and cerebral, this conversation. This isn't five bullet points to building a better employee because we're beyond that. You're intelligent people. I'm an intelligent guy. You're a professional. I'm a professional. We've got difficult and changing times around us and we need regular people to step up and help. But the only way things are going to get better is that we have to go down to the micro. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got, right? Well, you've heard me say that. So you got to look at how you think and approach things. So what I would do if I were you is I'd, I'd take this little pattern of thinking, put it on a three-by-five card, and start, a, start carrying it around with me. Oh, that's sick. That's crazy. You. Okay. Well, then things are going to stay exactly the same. It's not somebody else's job to build you a country. It's not somebody else's job to build you a town. It's not somebody else's job. Well, Ian, sometimes it is our job. That's how we have a job. <laughs> I get it. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about leadership at all levels. Okay, look at this pattern of thinking. Like, how do you make a decision? I don't know. I just got a kind of a feeling. I hear some information. I make a decision. Okay, is that serving you well? Did that serve you well when you bought that second house? And then you thought for sure you'd be able to spin it, turn it? Now you're upside down, underwater in it, and you had to short sale it? Did that pattern of thinking serve you well? How about that investment you made in your brother's company? And now the whole thing's underwater? Did that pattern of thinking serve you well? You see, in difficult and changing times, challenging times, I would suggest to you our decision-making pattern of thinking is critical. How do we make decisions? What sequence do we put a decision through to make a good one? How do we mitigate the risk of making a decision? Well, how about this? Gather all the facts, as much information as you possibly can. That's step one. 
Step two, check your own emotions to ensure that you're, that you're not being served. Le- check your own emotions to make sure you're not being served poorly by them. Now listen to that. You can't let that emotion get in the middle of that decision, that emotional reasoning. So you got to check your own emotions and say, are these emotions serving me well? Are these, are these, are these helping me right now? Take the long view. I'm sorry. Sorry. Pass it through someone else. Pass it through somebody else. Run it by somebody, this thing you're about to do. Don't you wish you could do that before you hit send on an email? There should be a 30-second delay, maybe a minute delay, that the email goes into the outbox, sits there for a minute so that you can catch the, your composure and pull that email back if you need to or that text message or whatever. Pass it through someone else. Four, to always take the long view. Always take the long view. Where does this go in the long term? Where did I learn that? I learned that in, when I was involved in the venture capital business. What's the exit strategy? How, how are we getting out of this thing? So don't start something unless you know what you want the end game to be. Well, I want it to be good right now. Well, yeah, well, okay, well, two years from now, five years from now, eight years from now. Check the decision against your belief system, your values, or your code of conduct. See, you could come all the way to number five and it'd be awesome until you compare it to what you stand for. And it's completely incongruent. Now, why does that hurt you in the long term? Every time we do something that's incongruent to our belief system, down in our core, that chips away at us. And, and don't make, make no mistake, that doesn't go away. And it's just like that uncompleted task. It becomes a burden. So every time we cheat a little bit, every time we lie a little bit, every time we bend the rules a little bit, every time we do stuff that's incongruent with our personal principles and values, it chips away at us. And it's hard to sustain that. It's hard to continuously improve when you have that burden on you. So before you make that decision, check it with your values and principles. Is it in alignment? Oh, it might make you a ton of whatever, but it is in alignment with your principles and values. Once you've done those five things, pull the trigger. Do it. You've vetted it. No looking back. Make the decision. Gather the facts. Check your own emotions. Pass it through somebody else. Take a long view. Check it against your values and principles. If all of that's in alignment, make the decision. And as you use that pattern over and over again, guess what? It becomes a part of that 80% of your unconscious behavior. You just do it without thinking. Now, some of you, you have a pattern of thinking. You have some way. Somewhere along the way, you got taught. But for those of us that don't or didn't, here's an example. And then finally, the innovative outside-the-box thinking, we've already covered that. We've already covered that. Okay, we got about five, six minutes left. So, regardless of your title or responsibility, you're a professional. And as professionals, we must continuously improve. That's that, that idea of a craftsman, craftsperson. The person who has their selected vocation, vocation and chosen task and wants to be great at it. So they're always getting better at it. And they don't need a supervisor to tell them to do that. They don't need anybody to tell them to do that. They got this thing inside of them, this, this continuous improvement thing inside of them that drives them to be a little bit better, that drives them to read the extra book, that drives them to listen to that tape, that drives them to get up and go for the walk, that drives them to do the things around them to be better than they were before. It drives them. So what are three things that you could do? Or what are some steps that you could do? I want to break them down into three things. List three resources you could use to continuously improve. Is there a mentor within your organization who you know is great at what you do, and so you go to them as a resource? Is there a book that you could read, a tape you could listen to, something you could put on your iPod or iPad or i-whatever-the-heck-i-you-use? I'm about to have enough of all this I stuff. Is there a group that you could be a part of that would help you continuously improve? You know what? I, all of the greatest performers in the history of mankind had a coach. 
They had someone that they gave permission to tell them what to do. And I don't care if you're just a frontline whatever and your grade, your job and your grade are whatever, pay grade and job classification are whatever. You're a leader. Or at least you have the potential to be so. So you, are you a clod of flesh that whines and complains that the world will not bend to your will? Or are you a leader? And you don't need to have a title to be a leader. But we need a bunch of leaders. That's why this thing is called leadership at all levels. You see, my bet is on you. <clears throat> what? Yeah, my bet is on you. There's thousands of part people participating in this program, and my bet is on you. Because I can't be in every town. I can't try to move the agenda forward in every community. <clears throat> I can't be in every neighborhood. I can't do that. All I can do is try to engage important people such as yourselves, try to give you some things to think about, try to give you some tools, and then try to give you a kick in the butt or a pat on the back or a shove sometimes to get you in movement. And then you go do something good in your town, in your department, within the four walls of it, figuratively speaking, or outside of it. That's it. And then I've done my what I think I can do to help make the world a better place. That's the simplicity of it. So what group could you be a part of that would help you improve? Every great performer has a coach. Who's your coach? And it's not me, because I don't live in your town. All right, list three actions you could take to continually improve. What could you do? I told you some resources. Now, what would you do with those resources? Could you have a coffee with a guy or a gal once a month? You talk to them, you share with them, you interact with them. You gain some insight, you gain some wisdom. Could it be that you go to a certification or a meeting on your own where you learn, where you grow? But notice that this is proactive in its thinking, right? Holistic, proactive systems thinker. You're thinking proactively. So where in the next year, the next 12 months, are you going to establish little points to continuously improve? See, that's the key to this thing. You get proactive in it. You don't wait for the crisis. You don't wait for the problem. You don't wait for your wife or your husband to yell at you. You don't wait for the boss to be down on you because you've slipped a little bit. You don't wait for that. That's that whole idea of continuous improvement. Kaizen, I'm ahead of the curve. I'm always challenging myself to grow. So look out over the next year and say, what am I going to do this week? What am I going to do this month? What am I going to do for the next three months? What am I going to do for the next 12 months to help me get better in this thing or that thing or this thing and that thing? It doesn't have to be complicated. It's common sense. It just needs to be done. The likelihood of it being done increases. That's that whole idea of having a plan and working your plan. This is the beginnings of that. So list three actions you could take to continuously improve. List three steps you could take to help your department continuously improve. What could you do within your department to help it continuously improve? Give some feedback. Be a part of a, 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 an employee group that's helping with a problem. Give some suggestions to the director. What is it that you could do? Well, I'm going to get shot down. I'm going to get attacked. Whoa, 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 pattern of thinking. Hello. Well, that's what's happened in the past. Okay, so it's impossible. It's impossible. Well, it is for my boss. Hold on now. That's see, pattern of thinking. Right there. Some of you, as soon as I said that, you jumped out. Your pattern of thinking kicked right in. So what are three steps you could take? So three resources you could use to continuously improve. Identify them proactively. Three actions you could take to continuously improve identify them proactively and then work them into your plan. Three steps that you could help your department, identify them proactively. See, by identifying them proactively, the likelihood of them getting done actually increases. Helen Keller said, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of man as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long right than outright exposure. What's your point, Ian? My point is don't buy into the lie. It's a lie to think that one day you're going to make it. 
That's short-sighted, and it lacks wisdom. Now, you might win the lottery, but even if you do, you and I both know story after story of the guy that had the millions and lost it all, and his life's a shambles. That's because he didn't take care of these basic fundamentals that we're talking about right here. On a more relevant note, closer to home, you in your department, in your agency, may be going through difficult and challenging times. So it's incumbent upon us not to be rigid. Rigidity will not get us where we want to go. Being able to adapt and overcome will get us where we need to go. That's where safety and security lies. I'm not talking about changing principles and values or what you stand for. I'm talking about approach, the way we do things. All right, we got three weeks to go, three weeks to go. Three more emails and then we're done. I hope you'll thoughtfully consider what we talked about. Take care, everybody.